Travel all over the countryside, ask the Leylands, ask the Leylands, travel all over the countryside, ask the Leyland brother. Whatever it is that you want to see, ask the Leylands, ask the Leylands, no matter whatever that happens to be, ask the Leyland brother. Come on, me in and then join in the fun, travel all over Australia. This week we have an interesting variety of stories. Our first one comes from South Australia, from Lindock. There we have a look at the action-packed business of crop dusting. Then we go to North Queensland, to Cairns, to meet a man who carves coconuts. Our final story comes from Mildura, on the Murray River here, where we step onto an old working paddle steamer. In a paddock just outside Lindock in South Australia, a solution of insecticide is being mixed in a huge container in readiness for spraying a citrus orchard. And we've arranged to film the operation to answer Darrell Whitnoon of Hawthorne in Victoria's question to see crop dusters in action. Guy Lloyd of Lloyd Aviation is a specialist in crop spraying and uses on this occasion a helicopter for the citrus trees. This machine can carry 360 litres of solution on each load and because of the relatively low speed of the helicopter and the fact that the downdraft from its rotors stirs up the leaves on the trees, it's much more effective on these kind of orchards than a fixed wing aircraft. In Australia there are only three helicopters in use for agricultural spray work, although in other parts of the world they are used much more widely. They cost more to operate but for certain types of crops, they are far more effective. Before a pilot can do this kind of work, he needs to hold a commercial pilot's licence and then hold a rating for agricultural spraying. Flying in and out of tree-lined paddocks certainly seems death-defying to the average observer, but Guy insists that it's all in a day's work and perfectly safe. Some spraying is, of course, a lot more difficult than others, and uh, we sometimes spray, say, cereal crops where we've got open paddocks with no obstacles in them, and um, for an experienced pilot is very, very easy work. But then you can get situations of uh, spraying small areas, a lot of them with power lines and trees and houses and other things to worry about and obstacles. And uh, then it became, can become very difficult. And the pilot will generally take a good look at himself and uh, pull himself into gear before he actually goes in and starts to attempt to do the job. Um, the main thing to worry about is, is uh, certainly the maintenance side of the machine. It has to be operating effectively and efficiently. The pilot can't afford to have anything else on his mind. He can't afford to be worrying about um, his family or financial problems or anything else. He's got to be right with it and concentrating on the job. And he's got to be able to um, uh, have good judgment in uh, um, avoiding things. Fast replenishment of the spray tanks by the ground crew all go to make up an efficient operation. Well, I think most people who have seen crop dusting on films and that would probably think it's pretty dangerous. Is it really dangerous? Well, it's uh, like what they say about driving, I suppose. It can be as dangerous as you like to make it. Um, certainly, you're flying close to the ground flying heavily laden machines, um, sometimes flying near the stall, it's the stalling speed. And if you do get a malfunction or if you do lose concentration, then you can uh, quite easily have an accident, yes. So, but if, if you approach the business uh, in a very uh, thorough manner and uh, you've had good training, well, uh, you should be able to do it quite safely. So crop dusting pilots can live to a ripe old age, just like oh, anybody yes. else. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Guy has worked with a conventional fixed wing aircraft for 10 years before starting work with the helicopter. And these days, planes like the Pawnee are designed especially for crop spraying. It has wire cutting struts all over it, 
and the cockpit is stressed to take an impact and leave the pilot in one piece. Guy told me of cases where pilots have crashed into huge electrical transmission towers and simply walked away without a scratch. There's no doubt that the thrill of the high-speed low flying is very spectacular to watch. Guy says that flying the aircraft is a secondary consideration, really. They like to be thought of not just as pilots, but as spraying contractors. He said the pilot is concerned with such things as wind drift, the droplet size, the rate of flow, and the precise cutoff point for the spray. With such an array of meters and instruments to watch, flying the plane over trees and other obstacles is just a matter of course. In spite of what Guy says, I think that crop spraying must require something exceptional in a pilot. This kind of action, after all, is not everyone's idea of earning a living. We've come to the tropics to answer a request from Louise Brown of the Upper Burnie Primary School in Burnie, Tasmania. Louise wrote and asked if we could show her something about coconut trees and where they grow. Well, Louise, we've come to the far north Queensland to answer your request. Coconut palms grow and fruit in tropical areas. Most of Queensland's far northern beaches are fringed by coconut palms. The original palms grew from nuts carried by the ocean from the Pacific Islands. Many more palms have been planted purely for decorative effect. No, it's not a shrunken head, but it looks like one. It's really the creation of Alex Pavusa of Cairns. It's a carved coconut. Now, Alex, yeah. what made you start carving coconuts like this? Ah, uh, not me. My wife started it. And uh, I didn't like her carving. I've been too much criticizing. So she threw some knife there and she said, if you want, carve itself. So I have to do it itself since. But how long ago was that? Oh, that's only 20 years ago. 20 years? <laughs> <laughs> Are they a difficult thing to carve? Uh, it's a uh, skill. And you know, when you look, look at a coconut, you must know what, which head is in it. Is you can't copy a head. Every head must be his own face. Has anybody tried to copy this idea? Oh, a lot of them. Only all, everybody give it away. Alex grows his own coconuts right here in his backyard. Once in this country, once in another country. In the last 30 years, I was, I was in Germany. And from there, I come out here. When you came to Australia, did you come straight to Cairns? Yes, straight to Cairns. And I wouldn't like to leave Cairns. I would have to leave Cairns or around Cairns, the nice tropical part. I would leave Australia. Then here is the nicest place from the whole land. Now, when you first came to Cairns, did you start uh, carving coconuts, or did no, you do? No, I am fit and turner. I was working in an engineering shop, and after when the rock hunting goes on, went there and uh, bought some in, and then I started uh, mounting crocodiles. And I did that right two, three years ago when they banned the crocodile shooting. So I have to stop it. They won't allow us anymore. We're waiting that uh, we'll be released again. Uh, they give a boat to shoot, then we can do it again. And otherwise, I'm around in my garden and that's all what I'm doing. 
then and when a couple of heads. When I feel like others go out on the beach out or drinking somewhere, and I sit down and enjoy myself with carving. You can do it only when you feel, when you have a, a feel like to do it. It's not to sit down and carve the whole day. You can't do that. Then the pets won't turn out good. Only when you feel like, do you do it then? And then it turns out. If you don't feel like, throw it away. Now it's only a hobby with you, isn't it, Alex? Yes. It, it can't be. Who, who would buy for it if, if I would uh, get it as a commercial buy? I said, nobody could buy for it. And I need two, three, sometimes four hours for one. And what I'm getting for it is nothing. I wouldn't get even, even 80 cents an hour. It's only a hobby. Yeah. You know, at least with the coconuts like that, you pick up a head, a, a coconut, then you can see in the form of the nut which sort of a head you can cut out of it. It's not uh, that you take a, a model or pattern, uh, it's cut after that, you can't do it. You have to take the nut and look, look at the nut and I can see the head in it already, what will come out of this coconut. Everyone looks the same, but to you, to me not. I can see in a coconut a head, and this head, every every nut is different, and every head will be different. I can't have two exactly the same heads. It is not possible. You have to work after the nut, how deep the nut is inside in the husk. That makes a difference, and. Uh, some, some nuts I have to throw away, they're too brittle. The others are again too, too soft. You must have a very sharp knife. You can't cut it like a, a timber. In a timber you take chisels, drills, chisels and everything to cut it. You can't do that with a coconut. You must have very, very sharp knives that you can shave yourself and it cuts your hair on your hand. Then it's good for carving nuts. Alex's wife, Margaret, adds the finishing touches to the carved heads. She paints and varnishes the coconuts to complete the works. Nearby souvenir shops sell as many heads as Alex can make. Alex gives Pat some instructions on coconut carving. It is not as easy as Alex makes it look. After all, he has 20 years experience. We are sad to have to report that this unique art form of Alex Pavusa is at an end. Alex died of a sudden illness a short time after this film was made. His family agreed that Alex would have wanted the film to be shown. Alex was one of the happiest people we've met, as happy as the faces he carved from his coconuts. Mr Herbert W Price from Lidcombe in New South Wales has written to us and said that he comes from a family which lived on the Murray River for three generations and because of that he's very interested in the Murray River area and in particular in the old steam driven paddle wheelers which used to ply the Murray in years gone by. Well in answer to Mr Price's request to show some of this we're going to take a look at paddle steamers or in particular one paddle steamer, the Melbourne. Now, there's been other people riding in and want to see paddle steamers too. So in this segment we're going to meet Alvy Poynton 
that's the captain and owner of the Melbourne, and see what he has to go through each day to get up steam on the Melbourne so that people can recapture that spirit of the old age of steam which Mr Price refers to in his letter. Although the Melbourne spends the nights in front of Albie Poynton's home on the New South Wales bank of the Murray River, the steamer is operated daily from Mildura on the Victorian side of the river. For Albie, the day starts with the cleaning out of the boiler ashes. He then tests the level of the water in the boiler from yesterday's run with the boat. Although the water is quite hot after an all-night stand, it is still referred to as cold and must be slowly brought up to 150 pounds of steam pressure. Glowing coals from yesterday's fire are used to ignite the new fire, but this must be carried out slowly, otherwise the boiler could be permanently damaged. Getting up steam takes around two hours with these old engines and the continual maintenance is probably the reason that there are few original steamers still operating on the Murray. There are plenty of paddle wheelers but most have had their power plants converted to modern diesel engines. Albie's morning includes loading a rather large quantity of wood on board the Melbourne for it burns quite a bit on each run and the Melbourne runs daily with loads of passengers keen to capture the spirit and pace of the last century. There's an art in every occupation and with steamboats it includes such things as using the bent and twisted logs to feed the firebox whilst stacking the straight timbers neatly ready for use. Albie carries out these tasks with practiced skill in the same way it would have been done in the days of steam. Just another part of the truly authentic methods which Albie likes to demonstrate. Before each day's run, a number of self-oiling reservoirs must be topped up. This mass of exposed moving parts is one of the fascinations of the steam engine. By two o'clock each day, Albie moves the Melbourne about 1,000 metres down the river to the wharf in Mildura, ready for the run with a load of passengers. A last whistle blast to call any late arrivals to the wharf and the Melbourne is ready to take off along the Murray as she has done for 60 years. Lorraine and Carmen join the crowd on board and settle back for two hours of gently cruising down the river. An engineer runs the steam engine while Albie takes the helm and informs his passengers of the various aspects of steamboat travel and points out places of interest. Um, I think originally there was about 300 paddle steamers built and used on the River Murray. At, only, at any one time there was roughly 193 paddle steamers. The Melbourne was originally built for the Victorian government and um, used as a work boat. In the early days, of course, there were uh, stacks of wood uh, established along the river every five or ten miles, and uh, um, the paddle steamers could pull into the bank and purchase a, a load of firewood. Most of the wood piles were owned by different uh, private enterprises, and often the paddle steamer would pull into the bank and the owners would be away uh, cutting timber and uh, they would load on perhaps 10 or 20 tonnes of wood and just leave a note uh, what paddle steamer had taken the load of wood and uh, possibly pay for that timber on their return journey. Today, of course, there is no call for such an honour system of wood piles and Albie Poynton must get all his own timber. 
This grand waterway was the highway for the inland in the latter part of last century and in the early part of the 1900s. Ports like Ichuka, further upstream, were huge and constantly busy with commerce. The river played a big part in opening up the country, but having served in this way, is now no longer used as a water highway meandering through the valley. Visitors like to recapture the feeling of yesteryear and there are few ways to do it more effectively than by paddle steamer. Travelling down the river with a gentle throbbing of the paddles driving the boat, it's easy to forget that the engine is being constantly tended. The fire must be kept up, the steam pressure maintained, the water replenished, and the lubrications of the massive moving parts watched. In this complex array of moving rods and shafts, it never fails to hold the attention of every visitor on the Melbourne. Most early paddle boats were work boats for hauling long strings of barges loaded with wool bales. They were built of shallow draft with side paddles to negotiate the often broad and shallow river system, particularly during flood times when paddle steamer captains would take shortcuts across flooded bends in the river. Mr Price and everybody else that rode in wanting to relive the grand old days of a steam on the Murray River, I'd say there's no better way than to take a journey down the Murray on the paddle steamer Melbourne. Australia. 